Then notice in letter E, because your ignorance is bliss is allowed, you must in fact then allow the buyer to find out if he truly wants to know. And that buyer under federal law has 10 days to sample your house for lead-based paint. So literally, if the seller wrote A1, I have no knowledge, and B, I'm sorry, misspoke altogether. If the seller wrote A2, I have no knowledge, and B2, I have no records, ignorance is bliss, the buyer still gets a chance to find out. The buyer has the right on E, letter E, to exercise his 10-day right to sample your house or the seller's house for lead-based paint. Now that's at the seller or at the buyer's cost. At the buyer's cost. If he wants it done, then he will pay for it. Or you'll notice the other option on E, he can waive his right to that inspection. Typically, if there's a question, he would exercise his 10 days and make that part of his home inspection. And if you think back way back to chapter one, we talked about home inspectors. I told you that they can have several different add-ons, like one could be termite certified, one could be mold certified, one could be lead-based paint certified. So if your client wants a lead-based paint inspection that he has the right to get, you might communicate that to your home inspector so that when the home inspector comes in to do the home inspection, he's also gonna take a couple paint samples while he's there to check for that lead-based paint, okay? Thumbs up. So the buyer gets the right to test it. Now notice letter F. Letter F is where you, as the selling agent, actually for the first time will go on record and mark your initials that say, I have given my client all of the information, the records, the pamphlet, and the notice that he has the option to test it. So we actually sign off on this as well saying, yes, I did my job, and the buyer got all of the documents that he was supposed to get. Then when you write the offer, you now send back to the seller this form again with C, D, and E1 or E2 checked, and the buyer signs it, and you send it back as part of the purchase agreement. Side note, you would also sign the seller's disclosure saying that the buyer saw the seller's disclosure and he would send that signed and send it back as well. So potentially when you make an offer, you could send up to three, maybe four documents in that offer. You're gonna send the offer, you're gonna send the seller's disclosure back to them signed, you're gonna sign the lead-based paint disclosure signed and filled out, and then you probably would send some kind of financing statement for your buyer to prove he's qualified to buy the house. We talked about that a little, but that would be the fourth document. So if you're making an offer, it's not just an offer. There's actually a slew of documents that would go back to that listing agent to prove your buyer got the form, got the seller's disclosure, here's my offer, and here's my, it's called the letter, uh, approval letter. I've pre-approved to buy the house. All right. Now, lead-based paint works in the same manner for remediation. You don't want to move it. So the answer for lead-based paint is the same as it is for asbestos. You want to encapsulate it, cover it up, repaint over it, Okay. Now I'm going to tell you that I'm not the world's best expert on housing and HUD and their lead-based paint rule because there are some anomalies where things like you can't repaint, like the window sills 
and the frame that the window's on because of the friction would wear it off. So there are some places where encapsulation will not handle. Now, the other thing is this lead-based paint form also works with landlords and tenants. If a landlord is renting out a property to a tenant and the property was built before what year? 1978. The landlord would give this tenant this form. Now, it's the same form, but there's a special one for landlords where they've swapped out the word buyer and seller and they've replaced it with landlord and tenant. But it's basically the same form, A1, A2, B1, B2, C, D, E1, and 2, and then the landlord would sign, all right? So it's the same form. It just uses the word buyers and tenants. We are more used to the ones that's going to say, I'm sorry, it says landlords and tenants. We use the one that says sellers and buyers because we're dealing with the conveyance, okay? Are we cool so far? Yeah. Radon. Radon is a colorless, odorless byproduct of part of the natural decom decomposition of anything. Everything in the world is radon, was radon, or will be radon. It is what they call a daughter product. So as things decay, it will come up from the earth. It is a A1 carcinogen. Everybody know what the word carcinogen means. It means cancer causing. It's what they call an A1 cancer causing, meaning we have human data that shows it causes cancer. So we literally have proof. Okay. Now it is comes from the soil and comes up. I will tell you that we do not typically have a lot of problems in the center of Indiana because our soil is got a lot of clay in it. And that blocks the radon from coming up. Now, places like as you get further south, Martinsville, Bloomington, Kentucky, where there's a lot of caves and quarries and things like that, you get it coming up from the soil. And that is the problem. If you have an unfinished basement, a crawl space, those are typically areas, sump pumps, if you don't have the lid on your sump pump, those are typically areas that you would see radon coming from. If you have a finished basement with flooring or live on a slab where there's concrete, that too will block the radon, all right? Now, I'm not, I've only probably done five or six or 10 radon tests in my career. They're very easy to test for. Actually, you can do it today. Well, not today because we can't go anywhere, but literally you can get a radon testing kit at Home Depot and it looks like a cat food can or a tuna can. It's about that big around, about that thick. And you literally pull the top off and you set it in your basement and 24 hours later you go back. If that color of that gel in there has changed color, that means there was an interaction with a radon molecule and you there is radon in your basement, all right? So you can literally test for that fairly simple on how it works. So when your home inspector is required or asked to do a radon test, that's literally what he will do. While he's in there inspecting the home, he'll go down in the basement, pop the top, set the thing, and then he'll go back tomorrow to pick that up to see if there was any kind of radon exposure. <coughs> now, the good thing about radon is we actually have radon mitigation systems. You guys know what a sump pump is, right? Water goes in your basement. You've got a pump that sucks it out and spits it outside, and it goes to the atmosphere. We have virtually the same concept in the uh, radon mitigation system. 
it literally sucks. It's hooked to the window, and it's a tube that comes down, and it sucks air constantly across the basement floor, and then it sucks it out and blows it out the window on your neighbor next door. So guess what this neighbor is doing over here? He's blowing it this way, and you're blowing yours that way. No, I, I don't know. <clears throat> so that's how the radon mitigation system works. They're about 1500 bucks ish to get one installed. And the ironic thing for radon, the magic number is four pico curies. Now, pico is not the sauce in Mexico. In this particular case, it means 10 to the minus 9. So literally, here's the number we're looking for. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's a very small number. Four Pico Curies. Anything over four dictates that there needs to be a radon mitigation system in place. All right. I don't believe they ask you that number on the test, but that's just for your knowledge. All right. So let's keep moving on. Formaldehyde. There in your book. Formaldehyde is a possible carcinogen. It is a colorless, very odorful gas. Have anybody or does anybody remember dissecting the frog in biology? Remember that smell? That was formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is used as an embalming fluid and a glue. They use it as a glue as well. I am sure nobody here staring at your faces was born prior to December the 3rd, 1984. If anybody remember <laughs> that industrial accident, largest industrial accident in the world happened in Bhopal, India. 3M or Union Carbide, my mistake, I apologize to 3M. Union Carbide had a formaldehyde tank in the middle of the city in Bhopal, India, and it cracked open. And when formaldehyde off gases, it creates a toxic gas. We recently had the same issue with those FEMA trailers that went down to New Orleans after the hurricane. What was going on is they would use formaldehyde as the glue to stick the paneling on the inside of the trailer. And then they would shut the trailer up, put it on the uh, train track and ship it to New Orleans. Well, that whole time it was on the trailer, it was drying and off gassing into the trailer. And what happened is, as soon as they opened the trailer door, all that gas would come out. That was poison gas. All right. So formaldehyde is a colorless, very odorful gas that's used. It was, I believe, also used in drywall that came from China. That was an issue with it. We also had lead-based paint issues coming from China, if you guys remember, with the toys, the children, and the children chew on the toys. So we had issues of China still using lead-based paint, and that was just five years ago, six years ago. All right? Now, there's another cool thing. It's called urea foam formaldehyde. You can take, has anybody ever taken Mentos and dropped it in the Coke? If you've not, I would suggest you go out and get a two liter of Coke and get two or three Mentos, stand in the middle of your living room and drop the Mentos in and watch what happens. Because <laughs> don't do it in your living room, okay? It'll shoot a geyser about 16 feet up because of the exothermic reaction. Same thing here. You can take urea, which is a liquid, formaldehyde, which is a liquid, mix them together, and poof, it blows up into foam. It makes urea 
UFFI foam. They use this still, this concept. If anybody's ever seen those cans you can buy at a hardware store, you shake it up and you spray the crack in your house, and as it dry, it expands to fill that crack. This is the same concept, only they've removed the active ingredient of formaldehyde. I worked at United Airlines uh, before United Technology, and we made, you know, those cushions that you sit on? Your cushions can be used as a flotation device. That's what the captain always says. I used to say, not mine, because I just pooped all over it. I got to use the little kid's cushion beside me if this plane goes down. I, I don't believe in flying. I don't like to fly. Um, and they always give you this. Well, there are four exits. I guarantee if this plane wrecks, there's going to be exits all over the place. You know, there's going to be more than just four holes in this fuselage that I'm getting the hell out of. So I was on this one airplane and they would say, use your seat belts. And you never really understood why until this little kid was about four rows up and he was crying and he was three standing in the seats. And, you know, it was tolerable until we hit this air pocket and this little dude goes and smack the ceiling of the stove bin out. He was quiet, man. I'm sorry. I did get a good laugh at that because this plane went boom. And when it dropped, the kid goes, Dink! and out. He was quiet.